Hello, everyone, and welcome to Issues, Limits, and Possibilities, Responsive, Responses to African Students Displaced by the War in Ukraine. My name is Alana francis de Govaya, and I'm the Chief Program and Experience Officer at the Africa Center in Harlem, New York City. We are so thrilled to be presenting this program today in partnership with AP Investments, which is the first platform focused on connecting African students with, with financing to attend global universities. Our conversation today features a wide range of experts and will highlight the different aspects of the responses to the 16,000 student, African students displaced by the war in Ukraine. Before the war, African students in Ukraine represented 25% of the international student population in the country. The discussion will be moderated by my dear friend, Dr. Lydia Kamuntobosire, founder and CEO of 8B Education Investments. Lydia brings nearly 20 years of experience as a social innovator, diplomat, board director, and policy advisor. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. We are really grateful to the Africa Center for providing the stage for this conversation to happen and to gather the various experts who will be around the table conversing about the issue. As Alana said, I'm Lydia Kemuntobosire, founder and CEO of 8B Education Investments. We exist to enable African brilliance to have a global impact, connecting African students with global universities, the tools they need to make good applications and get offers, the financing they need to enroll, and the jobs they need to succeed. So you can imagine that when the war broke out in Ukraine and on our screens, we were seeing students in Ukraine who are from Africa, who are displaced, that nobody was paying nearly enough attention to. That is part of our constituency. So we started acting on it. We reached out to universities, asking them whether they had places for the students, and really started having conversations with others who are responsive to the issue, who care about it, who, who see themselves in those students and want to see more done for them because they have a future that is currently in limbo. So we're really excited that we're having this conversation today to highlight some of what has been a failure in how the story of African students displaced in Ukraine has been covered by the media and therefore some of the failures in the response to the crisis, but also some of what is really hopeful and is being done by everybody who cares about the issue and is in a position to do something about it. So really excited about the panel today and for everybody who has made time in their day to join us. So with that, I'm going to start with our first panelist who is Aisha Sese. Aisha, I'm so thrilled that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your time. And, you know, you're an award winning journalist. You've interviewed newsmakers and leaders. And my personal favorite is you interviewed the late Dr. Wangari Madai, who, you know, on, on whose, you know, the ground on which she walks is Holly or she walked uh, was Holly. And I'm just so grateful for the work that you have done. And for the Ukraine story, you brought in obviously your journalism and your background as an African. I read an article that you wrote in the early days in the Washington Post that was particularly striking in how the journalism fraternity was failing Africa yet again in covering the crisis. Could you tell me a little bit about that article and what led you to it? Well, thank you again, Lydia, for the invitation and, and to the Africa Center for hosting. And it's great to be with everyone. You know, I think that um, seeing the journalism community fail Africans in the context of Ukraine, while very saddening, wasn't surprising to me as someone who spent 13 and a half years you know, within CNN, and uh, mainly CNN International, I'd seen this over and over again, how um, internally, whether it's conscious or unconscious bias, when tragedy strikes, and it particularly affects Black people or marginalized communities, there's a kind of de facto normalization of that tragedy and that trauma, which leads newsmakers and decision makers in newsrooms to minimize it, and not necessarily give it the coverage it deserved, which is what I saw in the case of Ukraine. I came to the story via Twitter, which I found really shocking in and of itself, that it was because 
ordinary Africans who were being displaced and were struggling to flee Ukraine had gone to this democratic medium to share their experiences that we were able to hear their voices. And when I went back to mainstream media to see whether the story was being covered, I found this void. And it was in that that I was so enraged and even though um, saddened and disheartened, an eternal optimist hoped that it would change and didn't see the coverage change. That's what led me to writing the piece for the Washington Post. And tell us a little bit about what you said in the piece for those who haven't seen it. The piece is really trying to once again center the voices of African students um, and to really center the, 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 the varying experiences between them and native Ukrainians who were fleeing also. Um, I had, thanks to Twitter again, been able to connect directly with African students who were fleeing, who told me these terrible stories about being pushed off trains, being shoved to the back of the line, being refused entry, being, you know, in some cases gaslit. You know, one student told me that they got to the station and they showed their, their tickets and they were like, your tickets aren't good here. You know, and the person was like, well, my Ukrainian, I've been here a while. I understand what's going on or being told that there were too many of them to get to, to get on the train or telling them to go join a separate line to get on buses. And the piece is really about saying to the international community, let's not create this hierarchy of suffering where we say some people's needs are more worthy of attention than others. It was really my own, I felt that with my position having been in a, in a network like CNN, I had the opportunity and a sp special position to call out other big media organizations to say, this is appalling in this moment of crisis, you too are marginalizing, you know, African and, and, and other, other mi minority communities. I mean, we know that things happen to students from India and other places and China who also couldn't, couldn't, couldn't um, easily flee Ukraine. And so it was my opportunity to say, I've been in those newsrooms. I know what you're thinking and what you're doing is having a real time effect on the ground for these people who are trying to flee. And I think thanks to work of journalists like you and the work of other activists like Masiri that we're going to be speaking with, you saw a response from governments that were asking border guards who may have been having an instinctive reaction to the refugees or to the students that were fleeing and their instinct was, you know, we shouldn't be letting them across the borders. You saw with the changing uh, media narrative, more openness, diplomats showing up at the border and holding border uh, or, or asking that more openness uh, or, or at least the suffering be seen equally yeah. to your point, not create a hierarchy. Uh, th those stories were, that was for me, a moment of seeing how powerful media can be because without that story being told, every border guard is left to their own devices, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of those stories were, were truly heartbreaking. What would you like to see the media do differently next time, given that, Africa does tend to be seen as the place that people are fleeing from. So even when they're fleeing from a war in Ukraine um, and they are African, uh, they're not seen as being worthy of the same accommodation. What could the media be doing there to, to help that change? You know, I think, first of all, I just asked them to see our humanity first and foremost, and to see our suffering as valid as everybody else's in a time of crisis. Um, and I asked that all voices be 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 amplified because only in the only in the amplification of all voices do you get the full story you're only getting half the story and as media as as journalists our job is to bring all voices to bring the full story to the to the forefront and so i ask um i ask news directors and correspondents to question themselves and check themselves of their own unconscious bias i say unconscious but because i you know i guess i'm trying to be i'm trying to be generous um and 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 really question whether they have whether they're truly representative in their storytelling, whether they're truly representative in their coverage. And they have to check themselves. And that, you know, that's not something that they should just hope happens. That's something that they should be consciously working towards in terms of their coverage plans. And it is only, you know, just in the same way as Hollywood is now looking at, you know, trying to get more, you know 
um, parity in pay for women and they're, they're having all these these clauses put in contracts. So they're, they're asking for people to be conscious of what they're doing in, in their spaces. News organizations need to do the same and there needs to be accountability and we need to call them out when they fail. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing next step. I'm curious how optimistic you feel, Aisha, given that you have covered crises ranging from, um, you know, Boko Haram and the 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 girl the um, girls that were kidnapped in the Nigeria case. You've covered many many global crises, and here we are. This is yet another one. Do you feel optimistic that we're anywhere close to that checking being put in place? And related to that, you now have a very big stage as the CEO and a board chair for OK Media. You have a platform where you can do things differently. What do you how optimistic are you about others doing it and what can you do to perhaps blaze the way for others who 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 might be looking to do things differently so what i'll say about newsrooms in countries like the uk and in the us and 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 other um you know economically you know advanced countries is that until we get more Africans and people of color into those new rooms, into those newsrooms and into positions of decision making, it will not change. Until we are there at the table to advocate for our own coverage, until we are at the table to say that, you know, whether I'm going back to Ebola in my own country of Sierra Leone, where I remember having to stand up and say, why is it okay to put on screen pictures of half naked Africans dying in utter distress. You know, why is it okay to see us without, why is it okay to show us without any dignity in a way that you would not show Europeans and Americans? But if I am not in the newsroom or people like myself, people that look like all of us here who are sensitive and who have a, an inclusive perspective, it will not change. Yeah. It that will not speaks, change. That speaks so much to me, Isha, because I, I see my role as enabling, you went to Trinity College, Cambridge. Can we make sure that 10 Isha Sese's from Sierra Leone or a similar experience who go to Trinity College, Cambridge? Because then they have pathways to the tables where decisions are being made. That's one of the reasons where why we at HB do what we do, because we recognize exactly what you say, what you what, what you've just said, which is unless you have us in the decision-making table around it, policies will emerge and rules of the game will be created that are really not inclusive. And some of it has simply to do with the not having the lived experience enough to feel what they could be feeling if in fact there were people around the room who have that. So I, I really applaud that as a, an action point. And I'll press you on your OK Media uh, role. What do you see as a role that you could be playing going forward? Listen, I think that it is our role very much at, at OK Media throughout our, 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 two, our two publications, OK Africa and OK Player, to amplify the stories of Black and Brown people, to amplify the stories of Africans specifically in the case of OK Africa. And one of the things that I'm very keen to do as we rebrand OK Africa is to center the voices of young Africans themselves and not have it moderated or have interlocutors to tell their stories. I want, and I'm working towards creating platforms where you directly hear the voices and experiences of Africans without it being translated via other people. I want to create a platform where Africans can feel that they can come to a place where their own stories and their own experiences are heard and valued and amplified. So I think that, again, in the same way where I say, unless we're in these newsrooms, it won't change. I also say we have to own our own media platforms. We have to direct our own media platforms. Um, Twitter is a small scale version of everyone having their own media platform. I think that media organizations like OK Media and others, you know, from, you know, Blavity to, to other, you know, uh, to others on the uh, Black Enterprise, to others on the continent. We need more. We need more media organizations created and led and, and committed to Black stories and African stories. Um, and that's the only way we can truly control our own narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isha. Thank you so much for the work that you do and the ambitions that you have for your current platform. And now I'm going to take that story to Masire Aribot, who is the CEO of Noir United. And as Isha talked about coming to the story via Twitter, how did you come about the story of African students displaced in Ukraine, Masire? 
Hi, um, thank you so much, Lydia, for having me. And I'm so appreciative of uh, the experiences that you've shared with us, Aisha. Um, and essentially we came to the story as well on Twitter <laughs> and um, through different networks such as Telegram, different group chats. And what we did was we really tried to get, get into an understanding of what was happening to students on the ground and um, you know how we re how we could respond. You know, we are young people. We are in the United States, and we have networks. We have people that we um, know that we can help mobilize and help support members of our diaspora. And so we ended up, you know, working with different organizations, working with different people um, to really respond to this this crisis that was happening and address the racism and raise raise awareness about the racism that was occurring to African students. So you were able to get over the outrage everybody who was looking at that media, the media clips uh, was filling and really turned to action. Could you tell us a little bit about what you did, Masire, and the work of Noir United? Yeah, so um, just a little background context. So um, I am a, a master's student at Columbia University and getting my uh, in, Master of International Affairs and economic and political development with a specialization in Africa. And I'm also um, the daughter of immigrants from Conakry, Guinea. And so um, that is something, you know, given my background, it's something that has um, pushed me and inspired me to continue to um, work towards the elevation and the um, improvement of, of African people. And that's what we do at Noir United. So Noir United International, we are a global development and humanitarian organization that focuses on centering Black, uh, Indigenous, and other marginalized communities and creating um, development solutions for their communities, whether that be social, political, or economic development solutions. And, you know, we saw a need somewhere and we decided to respond to it. And whether, you know, whether that be development or humanitarian, what we saw was that African people back in Ukraine were facing racism and discrimination while fleeing for their lives. And this is at a time where, you know, the whole world is moving and galvanizing to support those who are from Ukraine. And, you know, those who look like me are, um, are the ones who face the brunt and the worst parts of the war, which is, you know, not only facing the traumas of racism, but also facing the trauma of fleeing a war, which is, you know, a twofold uh, trauma that is that is experienced. And so, you know, what we've done so far, we we got into this experience back in March, and we traveled to Poland, to Germany, to Hungary, to France, um, and we picked students up and transported them from the train station and placed them into Airbnbs, into housing with the Red Cross. Um, we even took students to their embassies so that they could speak with government officials about what kind of support they could um, receive. And so this is the kind of work that we ended up doing. And you know, we, we did this all on our own um, and just uh, supported through the, through the work and um, through the dedication of people who are like all of us here. Uh, people who care and who wanted to do something. And um, now we're continuing to do this to, to do this work. We're continuing to support students with basic necessities back in Poland. Um, we are continuing to support their mental health, you know, dealing with the double trauma of racism and discrimination and war. And then also we're continuing to provide legal assistance and legal support um, and increasing the advocacy and awareness about what students are facing um, in back in Ukraine and back in Europe as well. Yeah. So what is the average student that you're in touch with who was, and all the stories are really fairly unique, so the, the, this might not be a fair um, assessment to ask you to make, but are most, most students back home? Are more of them integrated within Europe? Are they back in Ukraine? When you On a given day, if you speak to five students, what would the greater number among the five be doing? So Where would they be? Many students are in Europe. And they are dispersed across different um, countries. So they're dispersed across um, Poland, across Hungary, across Amsterdam, um, Netherlands, excuse me, and Portugal and France. Uh, they are in many different countries across Europe. And what they're doing right now is really, really hoping for a miracle. Um, they are facing different barriers. I mean, we all know that uh, European European uh, immigration policies are very discriminatory and um, do not allow for migrants to be able to uh, integrate into their society well enough. And so, you know, many students are still 
you know, one, their number one goal is to continue their education. And um, that has been a challenge because of the legal barriers to that. And so that's something that we've been um, supporting. We work with several students who are in Berlin, um, across Germany as well, who are advocating and, you know, organizing demonstrations to ask for equal and fair treatment of um, all refugees who are coming from Ukraine. And, um, you know, African students are also dealing with another barrier being um, separated from the labels of uh, being considered a refugee. And so now they are only considered third country nationals who are from Ukraine, which limit them from accessing different resources and different opportunities that are afforded to those who are from Ukraine and who have Ukrainian citizenship. And so this is these are the challenges that African students right now who are in Europe um, still waiting for an opportunity to continue their education are facing. And those who um, those who we've spoken to have gone back to their home country, um, unfortunately, they have regretted that situation um, and making that decision in such a um, in such a difficult time. And, you know, right now their goal is to figure out what it is that they can do to continue their education. And, um, you know, coming back to Europe is is a is a hope but it's very difficult and challenging given the, the structural barriers that are in place. Yeah, it's really challenging, Masiri, right? Because many students were sent to Europe to open the way for families and communities, and now they become refugees um, mm -hmm. as a result of how immigration policies is differentially applied. And I was speaking recently to a Ghanaian student who was in medical school in uh, Ukraine, she went back home and she cannot get into the medical school in Ghana because she is out of season and there is a process, which means she has, she's not in school in Ghana. She cannot go back to mm -hmm. Ukraine and even more uh, frustrating, she cannot get her transcripts from her university in Ukraine without an agent, and then she's paid the agent, and the agent hasn't, uh, you know, uh, had those transcripts coming forth. So she cannot apply for third country universities, cannot go to university in Ghana, and cannot go back to Ukraine. So it feels like an impossible situation, and there are thousands of students in, in this situation, and that just is very frustrating, and something has to change. And I think I want to uh, uh, um, introduce Dr. Ali. Elta here, were you able to... Can you hear us? Oh, fantastic. There you are. So El Tahir is in Ukraine as we speak, a medical student in Dnipro, originally from Sudan. Can you tell us about how it is to be back in Ukraine, El Tahir? Everyone, and thank you for inviting me for this event. Uh, actually, it was uh, quite terrible the last, the last uh, six months since I left Ukraine like 10 days before the war. And uh, finally, I decided to come back to Ukraine to collect my certificate from the university. Because as you said, uh, like the situation of, of the Ghanaian student, I tried to contact the university to get my certificates, my original certificates, and also the transcript of the last two semesters. But there was no response from the university. And also they asked me like to go through the agents and they ask money and it's a big amount of money. So finally I decided to come back myself to try to get my certificates and then to leave. And I was lucky because I have uh, an Italian residence permit and that's allowed me to enter the country. And, and now and it's here like uh, in this city, the situation like it's uh, quite safe as compared to other parts of, of, of Ukraine, like since I came here. And like the life is uh, look like normal as before, before the war. And before I came, like I talked to the hostel owner here, why I left all my stuff before. And I asked him like, is it safe to come back? Because I want to be back there for a few days to get my things and go back. And he told me, yeah, you can come. Then I took the bus from Amsterdam to Ukraine, like it took me like uh, took me uh, forty eight hours to reach here. By I used a bus from Amsterdam to the border in Poland, and from Poland to Dnipro. Yeah, and so so now you 
have physically got your transcripts, which can allow you to apply elsewhere. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience um, in the early days of the conflict? Because you had uh, left for a little bit uh, from Ukraine to go back to Italy, and then the war broke out, and you spent some time in Luxembourg, some time in Amsterdam. I, I I, I recall you you had um, quite a quite a few experiences across Europe, hoping to take advantage of some of the accommodation that was being given um, uh, to displaced persons coming from Ukraine and finding that that was challenging. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your experience was like and the experience of your friends uh, during the early days of the conflict leading up to now. Yeah, actually, uh, first thing I have to say, like, till now, I didn't get my certificate because I tried to contact my agent, so to speak to the dean office to get the certificates, and I have an appointment with him tomorrow. I will go to talk to them to see, and also because I had to pay part of my uh, tuition fee of the last semester because I spent the money while <laughs> fleeing the country, so they asked me to pay first the remaining amount, then I can get my certificate. I will try to do that. And uh, I was lucky to be in Italy 10 days before the war. I went back to collect my PhD certificates from Italy. And the day when I was coming back, I missed the train to the airport. And then I missed my flight. One of my friends here in Dinibro, she texted me in WhatsApp and she told me, as an advice, please don't come. I think the war is going to start. So I said, okay, maybe these two signs, like to miss my flight and her message, I decided to stay for a week to see the situation and then I'll come back because my flight was on uh, February 20. Then after four days, the war started. I found myself in Italy, but I have no accommodation because I was staying with a friend at the university residence where I did my PhD. I spent a month there. Then I left to another city. I went to Genoa because it's not allowed to stay at university residence. I'm not an enrolled student. So I left there because I, I didn't want to cause him a problem. So I left to Genoa. I tried to find a room there and I got scammed by an apartment owner. She's an Italian lady. I paid her for two months and she took my money. She gave me the contract, but she didn't give me the key of the apartment. And I went to the police, I filed a complaint, but the police didn't do anything to her till today. They, they, they told me that we will, we, we will call you. Then during that time also, I applied to three universities because they offer financial aid and accommodation for Ukrainian students. So one of them was my university where I did my PhD and my PhD supervisor, she was very nice person and she's very helpful and supportive until now she's trying to find a solution for my problem. She talked to the, to the university administration and the committee who are in charge for this and to, to allow me like to do my clinical rotations at the hospital there at the same time to have an accommodation at least. Also they give financial assistance at more than 5,000 uh, euro for uh, Ukrainian students. And she told them like he, was our student here and now he's studying in Ukraine and he's here because of the war in Ukraine. But they refused. They said, you should be uh, an asylum seeker, a Sudanese refugee, not as Ukrainian refugee. So I applied to other two universities in two different cities, even they didn't respond to my email. I spent one month in Genoa that's with a friend from my country. And then I decided to go to Luxembourg because when I check online, like I, I tried to, to find a, a place. I checked Germany, Netherlands, and then in Luxembourg, I found that at University of Luxembourg, they provide fellowship for researchers from Ukraine. And also they provide like a status of a guest student for the student from Ukraine. So I contacted the university uh, because I have a PhD. So I said, okay, it, it, can, it, it, it would be good to join them as a researcher. And I sent them an email, but they told me, unfortunately we can't accept you as a researcher because 
you, your status in Ukraine as a medical student and not a PhD student or a postdoc student in Ukraine. Then they said, we can accept you only as a guest student. I said, okay. I applied, I filled the application and I sent the documents and they accepted me as a guest student. They, they gave me the ID card, but they told me as a guest student, you have access only to language classes, <laughs> like French or German. Yeah, but not like, uh, not to any medical uh, programs because they told me the program in English, uh, no, sorry, in French, uh, in German and Luxembourgish language. So you have to have C1 level of the language to join. I told them at my university, they, because that time we were doing online classes and my university, they gave us letters to universities in the countries where we are residing to allow us to do our clinical rotations in their hospitals with their students. Unfortunately, no one accepts us to do that. I sent the emails and these letters to several universities, different places, but there was no response. And uh, in Luxembourg, uh, I spent almost two months there. And thanks to uh, one organization there led by an African lady, her name is uh, Madeleine Yogi. It's called uh, One People. Actually, she, she worked hard to help us to, to get the temporary protection because there we are African, we are around less than 100 students. And uh, I think they accepted less than 10 students. And for my case, even what, what they did, like in the beginning, before I came, they told me that the other students, when they came there, they separated them from the Ukrainian at the residence. And when they complain about that, then they brought them together to the same place. So when I went there, in the beginning, yeah, they welcomed me at the reception center and they told me, okay, fill this form. I filled the form, that's for the application. For Ukrainian, it took maximum a week. They called them for interview at the same day, they received the temporary protection. For us, it took, for other students, some students, they took like two months. For me, it was around 46 days. I was waiting just to go for the interview. Even they called me after I sent them a second email and I told uh, one of the staff of the Red Cross, I complained, I told him, okay, if they don't want to call me for the interview, I will leave the country, but I cannot wait like this. And finally they called me. Once I went there, they said to me, you don't have the right to be here. I told them why? They said, you should go to your country. I said, okay, I have a problem in my country. Like in Sudan, I can't go to Sudan because I have a problem. As you said in your, uh, uh, the, the, I don't know what they call it, the decision or the rule they, 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 they made. They said that those who cannot return safely to their countries can apply for temporary protection. I told them I have a problem. I showed them a proof because I was involved in uh, during the revolution in, in the, uh, 2019 in, in Sudan. I was writing reports to journalists in, in, in Italy while I was there. And because of that, if I go there, they'll arrest me. I told them, I told them since October when the military coup happened again after the revolution, I can't go back to Sudan. And my family are there. And they told me, you have an Italian residence permit. So it's an EU residence permit. And this residence permit, I got it because after I finished my PhD as a graduate student, I have the right to extend my residence permit for one year for to search a job. So I applied for that one and I left Ukraine. I was lucky when I returned back, it was ready. So I collected. That's why I have it at that time. But I told them I moved to Ukraine, all my stuff are in Ukraine. I don't have even a, a, an accommodation in Italy. And the lady, she told me even here you don't have an accommodation. She told me like that. And then they said, come next week and uh, we will uh, give you the decision. And when I came, they told me it's rejected and you have to leave the country immediately. Even they didn't say like uh, within a month, immediately. I said to her, how? She said, because you should go to Sudan or to Italy. And if you didn't go, uh, if you don't go, we will force you to leave the country like that. 
Then I said, okay, she asked me to sign the document. And in the beginning, I refused to sign, but she told me whether you signed it or not, our decision will be applied. So yeah. I signed it and I left. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the story is so heartbreaking, uh, Elta here, so heartbreaking. And I know when I initially spoke to you, you your, your experience was a little better than average because you have been able to get to the school. You had, you know, you already had some an Italian residence and you could move around Europe without the kind of implications um, or, or triggering the immigration concerns that ordinarily that would trigger. And yet it is so heartbreaking. Um, what I would, what I wonder um, and this is uh, both to you, um, Elta here, and also Masira, but in mo most important to you, Isha, Aisha, sorry, I keep on mispronouncing your name. Aisha, there is a, a big action point here, I think, for people like you who have a naturally loud platform or very big platform for people to listen to. The fact that students are being made to pay to take online classes or being made to pay for time that they did not spend in school because they were running away to safety or being denied their transcripts unless they make additional payment sounds to me like the kind of thing that should be more known Great. and some pressure put on the table for that to change. It seems like the kind of thing a bit like when students were being denied access on the border and someone had to be loud and say, this is happening, can it stop? What, what can be done, Aisha? It, it seems thoroughly unfair that students are subjected to this six months later when they have no protection in Europe and that at minimum they need a, uh, their documents to apply elsewhere. It is unfair. And um, I mean... It, 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 it also does sound illegal. I mean, I know the schools could run their own their own policies, but if they haven't taken the classes because they were fleeing, and now you're saying, as um, El Tahir was saying, they're saying you have to pay to complete the course, which you never completed, before we release your transcripts. I mean, it's it's exploitation and it's 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 so upsetting and enraging. But I do think now there has to be targeted pressure. I think that. Yes, um, there needs to be um, a, 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 a spotlight shone on on these specific on the spe on the specifications of these situations when people get into these countries and they can't access these these education systems. Which again, they're not making special disp you know it's not like African students are asking for special dispensations. They're allowing Ukrainian students to access um, their their colleges and educational institutions. And they're making accommodations for them, but for some reason we're seen as unworthy. That story needs to be told, that inequity, that discrimination needs to be told. But I also think that, you know, people like, you know, Ursula von der Leyen at the European Commission, I think in a targeted way, we need to target certain bodies so that they understand what is happening and that they in a very specific way can take action and put pressure. I think that just doing a blanket amplification to the public is great and we need certainly more awareness but I think now is the time for people who have platforms to now do direct outreach to people who have influence to be able to reach out to institutions to basically put pressure and affect change. I certainly think that we're past the point of just public amplification. Uh, we need specific change in these institutions and we need it now. We need it now and I'm really tired. I went to I went to um, Poland with Global Citizen to moderate a panel with Ursula von der Leyen um, from the EU Commission, with President Duda from Poland, with Justin Trudeau um, from Canada. You know, I sat at that table and I and I, I moderated this panel where tens of millions of dollars were pledged to support Ukrainians, right? These are all decision makers. These are all people who are actively sitting in the room to make decisions to ensure that Ukrainians are accommodated in neighboring countries. We need to put pressure. These people need to be aware in a direct, in, in, in terms of a direct outreach to people like that, to say, this is what's happening to African students. And in the hope that in communicating with them and publicly amplifying the story at the same time, that together it will create a pressure that will bring about change. Yeah. I mean, that is really what I think we need to do. We need to speak to specific people. We need to put pressure on specific avenues to, to, to make these policies change in these institutions. 
Yeah, I think what you're saying is so important, Aisha, because I think that, first of all, the story has retreated from the headlines. As far as people are concerned, the students are back home or somewhere in a wonderful campus, you know, continuing their education. Meanwhile, when you speak to students from Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, you're hearing story after story of A, I am not in school. B, I can't transfer because I cannot get my transcripts. And C, I can't just get my transcripts because of the logistics of getting there. Is that the school is holding onto them. Even that that piece only of the fact that schools are not releasing the transcripts is outrageous. Like, Mm -hmm. That is absolutely outrageous. It's, you know, if, if you assume that there's nothing to be done for the students in the EU, at minimum, they need their documents to go elsewhere outside the EU. Like, uh, you know, that minimum is, is required. So any action points that can enable some of this nuances to be put in the spotlight again so that it's not, you know, here are African students who have this hard to define challenge in in getting back to class but it's very specific points to you as you're saying Aisha where you know what can the EU commission be doing what can the who who else can be helping us put that pressure so that the schools can actually at minimum do that right thing of enabling students to have their their transcripts and I'm mi- mindful of the fact that the time is is um uh, going away from us. And so Elta here, we will come back to you again in as, as we're wrapping up. But I wanted to expand this, and especially in the spirit of what you said, Aisha, that you know we need to have targeted outreach and make sure that those who can do things are doing them. I wanted to start with you, Rajika. I'm just so thrilled that, that you're here with us. And to ask you, you, you know, your research, you've worked with Uh, a lot of organizations that are looking at um, expanding internationalization of U.S. universities. You are a lead at the President's Alliance for Education and Migration. You've worked for the Institute for International Education. Given your connection at that policy level and thinking about the US as as one you know as as an example of the kinds of places where changes make a difference for for students displaced in places like Ukraine what do you think should be happening in order to address a crisis like the displaced africans in ukraine rajika Thanks so much for having me, um, Lydia, and thanks to the Africa Center as well. And it's just, um, it's been such a sobering um, conversation thus far, and especially listening to Dr. Ali about your experiences. And um, I want to start by sort of reflecting on what this moment has sort of meant as we look at it more broadly, and then sort of talk about the US. And um, I think what the situation has really revealed for us is sort of these patterns of discrimination that we've seen around sort of, you know, tied, tied to, to race and, um, you know, whether it's primarily black students or brown students in some cases. And when I saw this playing out, what I immediately thought of was that, of course, the Ukraine situation has been extreme and the true crisis but that this situation is not entirely new because we've actually seen some a somewhat similar situation play out in India as well, where there's where India has actually traditionally attracted generations of African students who study in its universities as international students. And there have been episodes of xenophobia and discrimination against them every few years. So that sort of immediately came to mind as I as I saw this playing out that we unfortunately see this pattern um, globally. But I think in a larger sense, it's really bringing to the fore um, this idea that when countries host international students, they often become this sort of invisible population. They're not invisible in terms of their numbers, as we heard earlier that, you know, students from Africa made up a solid 25% of the international student body in Ukraine, which is significant, but they often um, go under the radar when it comes to support services and student services. And I think what this has really laid bare is the fact that countries need to have in place national policies, institutions need to have in place policies on how exactly they're going to support and serve international students in a in a holistic way. So that's sort of a, you know, a broad, a broad statement that I that I want to make. But I think at the at the 
policy level, it's also revealing some sort of in a, in a larger sense when we look at the US. I think it's really um, revealing what are some barriers to entry for international students. And I think that as we heard the comments from Dr. Ali and others, we saw all of those challenges and barriers being mentioned right from, you know, issues with entry around visas to, you know, um, uh, employment and so on. So if we sort of look at the situation with the US, um, there are some uh, barriers that international students continue to face again, sort of at the entry point, you know, when it comes to um, to visa application timelines, when it comes to whether students from certain countries and regions are being issued visas at the same rates as students from other countries. And are we are we truly attracting the full diversity of international students from around the world? that we potentially could be. So I think that's one. Another key issue at sort of, again, the policy level, if we look at sort of the entry point, is the way the international student visa is structured in the US, where it is still considered what is a, a, a single intent visa, which means that when a student is appearing, to, um, to seek admission to the US at a very young age, they are required to make that commitment that they have no intent to immigrate or to stay on beyond the immediate point of their studies. But as we've heard, students face a range of situations and are sort of at a very young point where they can't necessarily project what their futures are going to be beyond, beyond sort of that period of study, yet are being asked to make that decision. So that that is another sort of uh, real barrier at, uh, at the entry point, and it's particularly a barrier for students who are either fleeing um, difficult situations where they can't go back to their home countries, as we just heard, or in fact, are even refugee students, because again, there's really no home to return to, yet if they're coming in on an F1 visa, uh, they're required to commit to going back home. Um, once they are in the US, the real policy challenges are around again, you know, that path from education to wanting to really um, stay on and leverage their education. And uh, we're seeing this globally that countries, other destination countries have figured this out. If we look at uh, Canada, we look at Australia and other countries, it is understood that higher education is a pathway for global talent. It is a pathway to building knowledge societies and economies. Um, but in the case of the US, the, that pathway is very broken. So we really need better policies uh, that can support students in, you know, wants to finish their studies to really seeing that path from um, their education to careers, whether those careers are in the US or beyond, because ultimately it's really about building, building a global, um, global talent pool. So I'll stop there. No, thank you so much, because that sets the stage for what it is that both can happen for students or what is possible for students who are displaced in Ukraine. You know, can you and can you can you not come in and uh, and what is the environment like, but also suggests that there is a lot more that needs to be done um, that is beyond the current crisis, even if the current crisis is such an opportunity, especially given the US's response to the conflict in Ukraine, um, an opportunity for the US to leverage soft power of its institutions that are so coveted everywhere to open more doors to students regardless of nationality, therefore including you know, the black and brown students who have been displaced in, in Ukraine but there's a lot that's stuck and broken, as you say, Rajika, in the system so that the opportunity to get all this brain power uh, that is, you know, looking for a place to be located, that opportunity gets missed. Um, I wanted to ask whether you had any specific thoughts about or examples of what you've seen universities in the U.S. do, particularly around the, the, the Ukraine crisis that might be interesting or worth sharing with a group. I know you work with a variety of organizations that are, that are are connected with education and migration. Have you seen any good examples of the US being accommodating to displaced students, perhaps not Ukraine specific, but more generally, that could serve as an interesting example? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly the organization that I serve as a senior advisor with the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration has been doing um, a great deal around this, not just in support of Ukrainian students, but all displaced students, including uh, refugee students and just um, last year um, ran a large campaign called the response campaign um, to to explore pathways uh, to higher education for refugee students um, uh, to see if universities could have private sponsorship of uh, displaced students to be able to provide more seats for such students. So I think that there is uh, indeed a lot being done. There have been, there's just been a new um, scholarship program that was announced uh, just a short while ago, which is being implemented by the Institute of International Education, but funded by uh, a group of philanthropists that will offer scholarships for Ukrainian students in the US to help them uh, be agents for democracy. So I think there are a number of efforts underway at various uh, campuses as well, led by various uh, organizations as well. So um, I think there is a lot being done, but I think what today's conversation really reveals is, uh, as has already been pointed out, that there is a lot being done for Ukrainian students um both uh, you know within U ukraine and those who, who who are international students outside ukraine but what we are missing by focusing on that big picture is sort of other student groups and um and um, looking at sort of the thousands of african students who were in ukraine and who've been impacted so i think we need much more focused efforts um around um around that and sort of one one other point i just wanted to make lydia as, as reflecting on this was that I think um, all of these situations, and it, 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 this is not new, but I think for a couple of years now with everything that's been playing out, at least in the US, there's been a growing awareness of um, really viewing international students, not as a homogenous body who are just international students, but the fact that they bring with them certain, you know, they, they belong to a certain race and, the, you know, a certain culture and a context and acknowledging how that intersects with who they are, how that group is perceived in the US and what are those dynamics surrounding um, race and sort of really the intersectionality of it. And we've really seen that come to the fore just in the past couple of years as the social justice movement and the Black Lives Matter movement in the US it's, has, has gained momentum and certainly international students as part of that um, have also um, you know, been very much a part of that conversation. Yeah, that is really, really important. And it segues very neatly with our next two speakers who I, I wanted to draw attention to the work that Adedayo is doing. He is the chair of a medical university in Aruba and, um, and also to bring in Emily from Miles College, um, who are exactly as what as you say, Rajika, uh, the places where uh, African students displaced in Ukraine for whom there have been many policy failures in Europe and inadequate response in, in the US, places where they could be at home, if you will. I wanted to start with you, Adedayo. What was your response to the differentiated treatment of Ukrainian and African students at the beginning of the war? Um, and I wanted to ask you the same question, Emily. And then what do you see as your role running institutions that are very uh, diverse and Africa friendly. In your case, I did die, it's a medical school in the Caribbean. And for you, Emily, it is a historically black college and university in the United States. Starting with you, Adidayo, your initial response? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lydia. Uh, just a small correction. We're at, our, our campus, we're actually in Antigua, not, a, not Antigua. Aruba. I apologize. Yeah, Antigua. Um, no, but um, when I first, when we first came across um, uh, the news and everything. I mean, looking, the initial treatment of the students of different cultures, particularly African students and black and black and brown students, I mean, it was, it was infuriating, quite frankly, to say the least, because um, especially initially, we, I guess, perhaps due to the media, we didn't really get a really 
good look of what was going on until you really make a, dive, deep, a, a deep dive. And uh, we learned a lot through uh, social media, much probably like the rest of the world. And quite frankly, I mean, when we, when we first saw what was happening and started hearing what was going on, that was the first thing that we did was to try to jump into action and see how we could help these students because we are the only African-owned institute, medical institution in, in, our, in our region. And so, you know, it, was, it is our duty to try to help our people any way we can possible. And um, our institution, we our motto has always been medical school to the world. So we have students from all over the world who come to us. And so, you know, especially hearing how African students were being treated, we just knew we had to jump into action. Um, we initially started the process of trying to um, trying to reach out by reaching out to different uh, African governments. And of course, some some governments might be slow, and there might be some political aspects there. And so we didn't get too much uh, movement there. So once we started, once we were introduced to AB and its initiatives and seeing that what AB is doing is right in line with what we were trying to do, this was also just a perfect partnership to see how we can help these, these uh, students who are essentially lost in limbo. So. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. And I think part of one of the questions I have seen in the Q&A is how the world is supposed to respond when governments aren't as responsive to this crisis of African students. Because for, ma for many countries, let's face it, a student who is studying abroad is already a privileged student. So they really aren't priority number one to 37 of a government uh, that has so many other things to worry about, except that this is part of its global footprint. And so we, we end up caught in this, in this really difficult situation where the government partnership are, are partnerships aren't as forthcoming as, as they could be because of our prioritization uh, uh, difference. And to you, Emily, I know that you were involved in helping and thinking through the absorption of the students that were displaced in the Katrina um, situation in New Orleans. And as a result of that, the idea that displaced students can be absorbed by colleges is something that you have worked on. So when you saw this crisis happening in Ukraine, what, you know, and especially the, the difference in treatment for African students, what did that make, what, what reaction did that elicit in you? What role do you see for Miles College, given your experience with the New Orleans displacement? What role do you see for yourself in, uh, in addressing the, the crisis for African students displaced in Ukraine. Sorry, Emily, you're on mute. Thank you for having me, Dr. Lynch. And also thank you for this, um, the, the center for inviting me here. But the first thing that I did think felt about was in reference to what could we do to help our students? You know, HBCUs, I'm a part of HBCU schools, Miles is an HBCU school, small institution, liberal arts institution. And our first focus was what could we do to help these students? We know that education is first. We know that when being displaced is a true issue, you know, when students being about, because they're in a hostile situation at this point. And we want to know what can we do really and truly to understand untangle this hostileness and this environment that they're in and to be able to make students feel comfortable in trying to continue their education. And in speaking with the president, the first thing we thought about doing is how can we get these students here, give them a place to be here and to be comfortable in order to continue their education. So in speaking, you know, with certain situations that happened in the past with uh, Katrina and how students throughout the state of Louisiana was displaced. And what we had to do is to move together as a team throughout the country and welcome students. And many of the institutions that was welcoming the students were in fact HBCU schools. You know, the founding of HBCU schools came from educating students regardless to the color of your skin. And so that was where our focus was. Yes, we are limited in resources, but we will do our best to be able to help students. And so that's where we are now at this point, trying to figure out ways maybe to invest in students to, so that they can further their educations at you know, the institution here at Miles, especially. And also, we also talked about throughout other institutions here in the state of Alabama and what we can do to help our students. Yeah, that is so, so important. And in the interest of full disclosure, uh, we are talking at 8B with entities like Miles College to see how we can work together in order to expand both the enrollment of displaced Ukrainian students, but also generally expand the African footprint that Miles College has. And with Adedayo in his university, because one of the biggest challenges is medical school in Europe has is a very difficult 
um, discipline for students to transfer into. In the US, it's close to impossible. And mm -hmm. yet you have students, you know, like Tahir, who is in his fifth year. Yesterday, I was speaking to a Ghanaian student in her third year. They have no interest to start again. They mm -hmm. do want to continue their medical education. And, you know, to have an Africa-owned university address the, that gap is absolutely vital. So we're having discussions with Adedayo as well about how, in fact, more than discussions, we are working through how we work together to enable the students who are both displaced in Ukraine, but more broadly from Africa, who are looking to have that global, um, to take their brilliance globally, use uh, Adedayo School as a stepping stone. And also, Rajika, I know that we are we are looking to work together on thought leadership on what are the policy environments, uh, the, what is the policy environment we need in order for the US in particular to be more friendly to African students that are coming in. And uh, we're really, really excited about some of this work. Now, I will turn over to the team of the Africa Center to let us know if there are any questions from the audience that they would like um, that they would like the panelists to answer. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question here directed. Um, Aisha, can you see the Q and the chat? I can. I'm looking. Uh... But there are a couple of comments. So is there one specifically? Yeah. So there is one here around, um, uh, you know, how do we uplift the message to encourage Africans owning their media platform and giving Western media, uh, Western media leaders and negative attacks, you know, given that Western media... Mm, how do we uplift the message to encourage Africans owning yeah. their media and giving the Western leaders negative attacks? on the media and African leaders. <laughs> yes, well, um, <laughs> yes, I mean, listen, I think that um, it, it, on the continent itself, when I look at the, there is quite, there's a vibrant media, there's a robust media in various parts of the continent. But I also think that um, this, this in the, the independence of the media is also, you know, still being challenged in certain parts of the continent. And is, as he says, is under attack by certain leaders there, there in Africa. So I do think it's time for a new generation of, of um, media leaders. I do think that um, digital, is a way that um, creates new um, platforms and new fora for young people to be able to take charge of telling stories that matter to young people who, let's face it, looking at the demographic uh, makeup of the continent, you know, it's a young continent. We are the numbers. Well, they're not really young. I just realized I just call myself we. But the point is, um, I definitely agree to you, I agree with you that it is difficult when it comes to encouraging Africans um, to use the existing media platforms that exist in Africa. I, I have I have some reservations about them because I do think in some cases they are being used as personal platforms for for individuals to further their own gains. And they aren't necessarily about independence of the media and covering the right stories and uplifting the right messages. So I think it's time for a new generation of media platforms. And I think digital is the way to go. I think digital gives space for new voices to emerge um, and new storytelling to be told. But it's a difficult time for media everywhere. I mean, we know that. Um, but I think that there's also an opportunity here for young people to, to take hold of, of their storytelling. Yeah, that's so important. And there's a couple of questions about the credentials piece, and I'll direct those to Adedayo and Emily. Part of the challenge why it is so complicated for the African students who do not have their credentials and the universities are not releasing their credentials is that the universities that would be accepting them are pretending that this is normal when this is not. And as we saw in Katrina, Emily, nobody pretended it was normal. You knew that, you know, transcripts had been swept away. And so you, in, in some cases, students were given a test to ascertain where they were. And that was the basis upon which they were enrolled. Um, and, you know, Adedayo, I know in your case, because it's medical school and there is so much specificity about, uh, you know, what residency possibilities might be there, you know, hands might be tied in a variety of ways. But can you talk about the 
kind of flexibility and agency that you have as universities in being accommodating to these challenges that students are facing and they're not able to show you what they have done you know for no fault of their own um, mm -hmm. what what flexibility are you able to work out on your end I'll start with you Emily and then I did basically what it would be in reference to doing testing to see where they are to see if they would test out in certain courses that they were that they said they had taken in reference to where they would be in what classification they'll be placed in so you know for example if it's something in the English environment where they say they have taken their English courses and things of that nature we would test out to see what course would be they would be a freshman level sophomore level junior senior level. So there will be various types of testing for those students, not necessarily looking for a transcript per se. Miles At Miles, we have what we call an open door policy. So those are the things and opportunities we have for students is to really test out a certain amount of their courses. Yeah, that's really helpful. And there, there is one university we've been working with that does exactly that. Um, and in, in other contexts, they 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 do a rigorous um, course equivalence. They basically say, you know, here is the things that we think are the modules under this thing. Which one have you done or which one do you think you've done? Or give us a photograph of your transcript, because this is truly extraordinary that A, students might not have access to it. But if they, you know, they might in a year when we've all made a lot of noise and these universities finally, you know, do the right thing. But in the meantime, what are they doing, right? You know, right. we want to make sure that that, that is there. Um, Adidayo, what, what, what flexibility do you have on your end? So from our standpoint, we do, um, we do, we are doing the course equivalency evaluations. And um, so far, any student that has applied to us from, from Ukraine, um, they have been able to at least upload their unofficial transcripts um, and we're very open. I mean, we can we can definitely evaluate and we can accept conditionally accept students who just who are only able to provide unofficial transcripts. We are we are aware of the situation. You know? So um, that has been our process. Um, now, we, we do know that there will be some students who will either take a long time to get official transcripts based on how we you know, our conversations today. And we're also aware that some students may not ever get their official transcript. Now, situations such as that, um, you know, once we've once if a student has gone through our program and uh, is able to uh, at least have the unofficial transcripts uh, in our file for now, and then they pass through our program upon graduation, for example, once students are are trying to get licensed. Let's use the United States, for example, the ECFMG evaluates all international medical graduates. Now for say the US, if a student is unable to provide a, an official transcript at some point, it doesn't have to be now, it, but it could be years later, if they're able to provide that information, they'll be able to gain licensure or eligible to be licensed in the United States, for example. Um, of course, every country has their own processes, but as far as, allowing students to be able to continue their medical education we have we interview each and every single student. So we do the course equivalencies we are accepting unofficial transcripts um in lieu of official transcripts due to the situation so yeah no thank you so much yeah in some cases also we would also accept if that student has a copy of their a picture of their diploma and when they're graduating so mm -hmm. sometimes we will use that type of uh, device and, and make a determination on those students as well so they can also provide their diploma, picture of their diploma yeah. to the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for, for the work you do and that flexibility is so important. I know that Masira, you had something to add here. Yeah, I wanted to add in terms of um, really raising awareness around like the issues with the transcripts and you know what we as the international community can do. I mean, we at Noir United, have, we're working directly with students and this is a common issue that we've come across, especially you know hearing stories like Dr. El Tahir Ali, and, um, you know, several students who have faced same challenges as you have. And, you know, one of the things that we have done um, on our behalf is, you know, we've gone as an international organization and requested, successfully requested uh, the transcripts of students uh, from universities in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, now students, those students who have been able to receive uh, their transcripts are able to apply to more universities. Um, and then also like we are a part of a working group with the International Organization for Migration, with the International Organization for Migration. And, um, you know, we're working with several or other organizations, several other um, members across, sec across sectors to address the issue of third country nationals. And, you know, what we did was raise the concern. I mean, this is a, a, a place and a space um, to support this, 
particular marginalized group. And what we did was we raised um, the concern that, you know, these students are being exploited by their universities, you know, they're, you know, they're refugees, they're dealing with the trauma of war, and they cannot continue their education. And now, you know, we have some students who have had to play, pay $1,500 just to get their transcript, um, or have to travel all the way back to Ukraine just to pick up their transcript. And so, um, you know, what this, it, what this does show is that there is a need for a broader um, movement um, amongst the African community of African di diaspora as well, um, to really raise awareness about what's happening and see, you know, where, Black, where Black people are in leadership who have the ability to make changes and um, who be in the room, like Aisha said earlier, to make those decisions. And, you know, we've been, we've been doing our best to work with other organizations to raise awareness on this, but we also need to, you know, see how we can connect with several other Black leaders across the diaspora, um, connect with the African Union, connect with um, organizations that were created to do what we're asking for. And um, this is this is a call uh, upon other, um, this is a call to for help to a vulnerable community that we have um, been affected, by, that has been affected by this war. And um, it's important for us to look at this as an opportunity to engage members of our diaspora to come to the aid of one another when, in, when we're in situations where, you know, we cannot, wait for someone else to come and save us. And we cannot wait for someone else to come and give us these opportunities. We have to look to ways to create them ourselves and also to, you know, see what resources resources are in order to support one another. And so, you know, that's what we value here in Hawaii United as well. And, you know, that's something I think we'll take this um, as an action plan forward. You know, how do we engage um, actors such as, um, you know, government leaders, African leaders, um, you know, leaders in the Congressional Black Caucus and the United States, leaders who are in the, the, in the Caribbean as well, university leaders to come to the aid of African people who were affected by this war in Ukraine. Yeah, that is so important, Masiri. Thank you so much for that input. I'll now ask El Tahir to tell us, you know, if there is something this group could do, what could that be? What would be most useful for a group like this to do? And then I will quickly ask everybody else to think about what they can do and, you know, not because it's going to be done in the next five weeks or 12 months, but because we can all pledge to use the platforms that we have, both to talk and act out, you know, enable a new Pan-Africanism, but also actually to be the, the bridge between these issues that we know so well and the people, the places where power lies, because, you know, someone like Aisha, you, you sit in such powerful forums every single day and being able to articulate some of these issues whenever it's relevant will provide so much power to the creating some solutions. Rajika, you're in policy conversations every day. Adidayo and Emily, you're, you're the solutions, really. You're, you're the places where students want to end up. So really wanting to hear what we think we can do over the next perhaps 12 months or you know whatever time frame makes sense for us to be able to do this. So I'm going to uh, do that in one second after I ask Elta here, you know, your, your, your ask to this group, what could we be doing to help both the situation that you're in, but also the situation of other um, African students like yourself who are looking to continue their education after the displacement from Ukraine? Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Lydia and Dr. Adidayo for taking the initiative to accept the medical, African medical student at your institution and also for the financial uh, assistance because this, these are big issues for the student now, especially for medical students. Uh, actually, what you are doing now is what we need. And what I could ask like urgently to be done is to force the universities in Ukraine to give the students their transcripts. And at the same time, to force the governments in uh, EU to give the students more time to find like a way to get admission at universities, to extend their, their residence permit. Because I have friends, I spoke to them yesterday and today in Germany and some in Ireland. Those in Ireland, they are lucky because they got a residence permit for one year because there are few, I think few number of students there. 
and they managed to enter there like within the first week when they allowed the Ukrainian to enter. But those in other European countries, they have like uh, some of them, they asked them to leave like by the end of August. And I have some friends, they got extension for, a, for one month, like by the end of September, like less than 20 days uh, or yeah, they have, to, they, they have to leave the country. And now they don't know what to do. Some of them yesterday, they joined a uh, language school. And some of them told me that they asked them C1 level of German language. Then they can be accepted as student at the university there. And it's, it's impossible like within a month or two to reach this level. At least if the student get more time and they get at least uh, a residence permit for one year, they can find a way yeah. to, to solve this problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the call there, <laughs> and I'm looking at you, Aisha, the next time you're with Ursula von der Leyen, you have your talking points here, <laughs> which is, you know, one year residence permit for the students, not, you know, not every three months. Uh, thank you so much, Elta here. So, so grateful for for you know for those points and really mindful that we have only six minutes left and so wanting to uh, start with you um Adedayo then Rajika um Emily Masiri and then I'll finish with you Aisha on you know what you think um you know you could do to advance this cause going forward and then we will turn back to Alana to close Rajika um sure so I think that what needs to be done to advance the cause is sort of what the President's Alliance is also focusing on, looking at the specific policy barriers, which are often around immigration. But we are also conducting research on sort of what are the specific kinks or barriers in, again, that pathway from entry to graduation for all international students, but with a particular view to diversifying the international student population, which of course would include African students. Um, the one broader point that I want to very quickly make is sort of beyond what can we do is that there is a huge global imperative for this. Because again, if we look at this demographically, the world's future talent is coming from Africa. And yet these are the students who are facing the most barriers. And if countries don't realize that, to be quite honest, it's to their own detriment as they think about how they're going to build their talent pools and knowledge pipelines. So that's sort of a broader point that I that I did want to make. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, um, Rajika. Adedayo, a uh, quick one minute, you know, what you'll do. So, I mean, of course, what we what we started with was the scholarships, for example, and obviously the course course evaluations, in addition to um, the uh, unofficial transcripts, receiving unofficial documents. What we what we began with thinking that we started initially thinking that the lack of transcripts was due, you know, to the situation in Ukraine, schools being closed, et cetera, and obviously, and through this conversation as well, it's quick, it's obvious that there is, it's much bigger than that. And so, um, you know, some of our conversations today has even been eye-opening, eye-opening even for me. So like, for example, what Masiro, Masire was saying, forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, you know, if there's anything we can even do to help your organization, please, please let us know. I mean, the Caribbean, for example, I know they have been very receptive to, um, to, to the situation in Ukraine, the students coming to the Caribbean in general, our country in particular. So, I mean, I would love to be able to get on board with our local governments, our local ministers, to be able to see how we can push this to the forefront. Um, from a standpoint of obtaining a, 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 a official documents, this might be the push to, that might be, uh, this might be something that'll help us. And even for, students who are transferring, wanting to transfer to our institution to continue their medical education, perhaps even us reaching out to the schools directly, that might be a different viewpoint for them. I mean, it's, it might be easier for them to deny an African student who's trying to leave their school versus another school saying, we need this official yeah. document. Mm -hmm. We can try all these different things. As I said, initially, we always thought it was due to schools closing, schools no longer existing. Clearly, you know, now it's obvious and it's becoming well, more well known that it's more of a racial issue as well. So we just need to try anything we can do to allow these students to continue their medical education. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Adidayo. And I, I love the point you're, you're, you're talking about, and that's around the, the Pan-Africanism. You know, think about the Caribbean governments together with, you know, HBCUs and schools uh, in the Caribbean, yeah. you know, together with African nations to the extent that one can get them around the table really responding to this um, in, in a manner that is, that is change-making. So grateful for the work that you do. Emily, any quick reactions? And just to add into that in reference to financial assistance, what we can do to try to provide support for the students, you know, in scholarships, because, you know, as it is, the funds are limited in the, in the United States in reference to, you know, students that are not considered U.S. citizens, but there are a few dollars that are out there that we can try to build upon that to have resources for these students and take that worry of financial responsibilities from them. Yeah, absolutely. So important. And when you think about the amount of money being spent for uh, sort of the hard power side for the U.S., mm -hmm. think about some of that, just a fraction of that going mm -hmm. into enabling these students to settle and relocate to universities that are say in the West, the HBCUs that are natural homes for them. That would be that would be a massive, massive win, uh, both for the US's soft power and, and a response to the students' need. Uh, Masire to you and then Isha. Thank you so much, Lydia, for this amazing conversation. Um, you know, what we're doing at Noir United has been um, something that is really dedicated and really rooted in our values and our mission and, you know, uplifting and supporting those members of the African diaspora and making sure that they're centered in the solutions that um, are surrounding their struggle and our struggle as a community. And so, you know, in terms of continuing to support students from Ukraine, I mean, we at Noir United, we're continuing to support students with basic necessities, uh, food, uh, direct cash assistance. And we're also connecting them with opportunities um, to continue their education. Um, and we're also working to support their mental health, their you know, well-being, because it's not just about providing that immediate assist assistance now, it's about ensuring that they have the support needed to continue on and to live as a, as a thriving human being after dealing with the trauma of leaving the war in Ukraine. Um, and so you know, the, what we can do as a community, I think, you know, we've already mentioned so many great steps working with different um, government officials, working with different universities that are based um, in the United States and the Caribbean and uh, on the African continent as well. Um, my hope is that, you know, we continue to um, use these um, use this opportunity as a way to continue to support one another and um, increase awareness about the tragedies that happen to us because of the skin color of our bodies. And so, you know, as we continue to move forward and think about the ways in which we can um, raise awareness about uh, students who are uh, facing racism and discrimination, I just urge everyone to think about, you know, what this means for us, uh, what this means for our institutions, what this means for our society as a whole. I mean, addressing uh, the legacies of colonialism, addressing the legacies of imperialism, of racism, of slavery, and what that does to the Black community as a whole. I think that is the ultimate um, end goal here, you know, because once we once we center this, these issues at the conversation, in the conversation, we'll be able to really dig Deep, dig, dig deep and figure out what are the root causes of why African people have to leave their own home countries to achieve an education, to get an education, why when they do reach um, the European countries, why these structural barriers are put in place. And, you know, this war has only raised awareness and only shown us very clearly that, um, you know, Black people will always be treated as second class citizens and second class refugees, even in the time of war. And so this could happen to any one of us if, if a war were to break out in the United States, my family and my friends would have would be would be in the same situation as, Af as the African students from Ukraine. And so we have to remember that our struggles are interconnected and, you know, fighting one battle in another place only uplifts all of us as a whole. And that is um, that is what I want to leave with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masire. That's a, a motto that we share. We think of our work as being about global Africa, because the way uh, the, the, the way the African-American experience, the Afro-Caribbean experience, the Afro-Colombian experience, the way that is shaped has to do with the place that Africa occupies in the global imagination. So all these things are absolutely connected. And the, and the more tools we bring together to enable that interconnection to also be furthering and lifting lifting of all boats um, and, and advancing the global African story, I think the, the, the better and really grateful for the work that you do. And finally to you, Isha, and then to you, Alana. 
Um, again, thank you to everyone and, and thank you for the for this invitation to be part of such a powerful conversation. I'm going to keep it super brief as I'm mindful of the time. Um, I think, Monsieur, your words were, were, were a beautiful encapsulation of what we all could be doing. And so for me personally, let me just say, how can I help what you do um, with the work that you're doing and the outreach and in terms of, as you say, building that global coalition, reaching out to the African Union, reaching out to forces um, in, the, in the EU the decision makers that could really um, affect change here for African students trying to gain access to educational institutions. I will use my influence, whatever that is, my platform to amplify the story personally, to, to directly have conversations with people. And also professionally through OK Africa, we will continue to tell the story. And it is something that we need to rededicate ourselves to, to say that the story is not over and that the, 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 the trials and the trauma for displaced African students is very much ongoing. So I, I think that, you know, it's about you know, working together, um, using my own personal network and, and doing what we can to, to really make sure that the story and, and the plight of Africans goes, um, goes, goes, is seen. It's not just seen, but also that change happens. And yeah. I'll leave there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isha. And what everybody has said is so important because while this is just one instance of trauma within the broader African narrative, like with anything else, too many numbers make people numb. But when they see one example of a particular kind of suffering that resonates, it then opens up this window for a broader conversation. And I think that's what the displaced students in Ukraine are. They're a window into a broader conversation that needs to be had. Why are we here? Why is this happening? Why does Africa exist in the global imagination as it does? What are the what are the ideas in our heads collectively that lead to this being the reality when students were minding their business, you know, getting medical degrees, and now they are, you know, in camps uh, uh, while their classmates are over there, um, you know, within a, a classroom in Luxembourg or elsewhere. So really grateful for everybody's time. And, um, you know, I hope that we can all continue perhaps with Alana and the Africa Center's engagement uh, from, you know, periodically checking in, even if only on social media to draw attention to how this story is developing and then obviously leaning into the work of people like Isha and others, um, Aisha and others to continue drawing attention to this. Alana, over to you. Yes, well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was an amazing conversation and so enriching. We're so, I feel so privileged to, to have had all of you on our on our panel today and for, for all of you to sh have shared your personal stories and also your, your work experience um, addressing these really, really important issues. Thank you so much, uh, Lydia to 8B, um, Education Investments for partnering with us, with us on this program. And this program is exactly what we're trying to do at the Africa Center, which is to really highlight the contributions of people of African descent. And this program did that so beautifully in a variety of ways. Um, so, so thank you so much to everyone who joined. Please make sure to follow 8B Education Investments, to follow all the speakers and the organizations, um, businesses and institutions that were a part of this conversation because they're doing such important work um, that is vital to the, to the upliftment of, of, of global Africans, as Lydia said. Um, and so... We really look to you to support and engage with us. Uh, we'll make sure to send you um, information that was shared during the chat, as well as contact information uh, from the panelists who would like to share that with you. But you can also just follow them on, on social media and connect with them on LinkedIn as well. So thank you so much again to all of our panelists. This was incredible. We really appreciate your time. We know you're all very busy doing vital work. So thank you for lending your time. And thank you so much again to Lydia for your excellent moderation and questions and for helping us to bring this panel together. We're incredibly grateful to, to 8B um, Education inv uh, Investments. So thank you so much. Okay, thank bye everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Home isn't just where we're from. It's the sounds that move us. The stories that shape us.
and the flavors that he loves. It's the communities that connect us. The ones that hold us down. The ones that raise us up. Home is a feeling we all know. So if you're looking for it, you can always find it here. The Africa Center. Home is here.